Hello, and welcome to a Classical Classroom Research presentation. I'm Daisha Clay. With me today is Princeton Miles, one of our beloved Music Lab interns. Princeton produces and hosts our show Music in the Making, and until very recently, he was a music business major at the University of Houston's Moore's School of Music, although he just graduated. Yay! Yay. He has graciously agreed to help me out with our episode today about Black History Month. Thank you, Princeton. Thank you, Deja. So Black History Month is particularly special this year because it's the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, for those of you who don't know, outlawed major forms of discrimination against racial, ethnic, national, and religious minorities, as well as women in the U.S. It um, signaled an important step toward equal rights for these groups, and it paved the way for others. Princeton, I'm glad you're here because... If there is one thing that I've learned from researching black people's contributions to classical music, it's that black people have contributed so many things to so classical many. music. Yes. <laughs> I've actually become a little worried that we wouldn't be able to fit all of this into a 10-minute research presentation. But I, I think with your help and with Todd watching the clock, I, th I think we can do it. Are, are, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Set? Mm-hmm. Go. In the mid to late 1700s, Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges was an Afro-French composer who was also France's best fencer. After Napoleon reinstituted slavery in France, Saint-Georges' works were rarely played, though lots of his stuff has been recorded since 1970s. Weird. In 1791, vocalist and composer Newton Gardner opened one of the first black-owned singing schools in the U.S. Wow. In 1803, <gasps> virtuoso violinist George Bridgetower, who had studied under the leader of the Royal Opera, played with Beethoven. Beethoven then dedicated his violin sonata number no. 9 in A major to Bridge Tower, and they premiered the piece together. Later, the two had a falling out, something to do with a lady, I don't know, mm. and Beethoven changed the piece's name. It's now called the Kreutzer Sonata. Poet Rita Dove wrote a book about Bridge Tower and Beethoven's relationship. In 1817, Jose Mauricio Nunes Garcia wrote Brazil's first opera, The Two Twins. Sadly, it was destroyed by fire. In 1819, Francis B. Johnson, a band leader and African-American composer in Philadelphia, published his first work, a collection of new cotillions. Around 1830, the Negro Philharmonic Society was formed in New Orleans. The orchestra had over 100 performers, including a few white members. Racial tensions rose, and the society ended just before the Civil War. In the late 1800s, Thomas Green Bethune, a.k.a. Blind Tom, was the first black concert pianist to gain recognition. And he was blind, too. Wow. In 1853, soprano Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, people knew her as the Black Swan, made her New York debut at the Metropolitan Hall. While she could sing, her skin color would have actually denied her entrance to her own concert. That's crazy. I know. But that didn't stop Greenfield. In 1854, this classy lady sang a command performance before Queen Victoria. In 1868, innovative composer and pianist Scott Joplin was born in Texas. Joplin wrote two operas, one ragtime ballet, and 44 original ragtime pieces in his short career before he died. In the 1870s, the Colored American Opera Company was formed. It was the first opera company of any kind in Washington, D.C. In 1878, James M. Trotter published Music and Some Highly Musical People, the first overview of African American music. In 1883, Marie Salika Williams gave a command performance for Queen Victoria. Amelia Tilgman became the first black publisher and editor of a music magazine, The Musical Messenger, in 1886. In 1892, the World's Fair Colored Opera Company, with soprano Matilda Ciceretta Jones, became the first African-American group to perform at Carnegie Hall just a year after the hall opened. Jones also sang before U.S. President Benjamin Harrison that year. In 1892 to 1895, Antonine Dvorak, not black as you might know, but stick with me, was director of the National Conservatory of Music in New York City. The woman who founded the school Jeanette Thurber opened the school to men, women, blacks, and whites. Pretty unusual for the time. Dvorak felt that a true American style of music should grow out of African and Native American music. Harry Burley, one of the earliest African American composers and one of Dvorak's pupils, introduced Dvorak to American spirituals. In 1898, Afro-British composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor wrote the musical Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. It was wildly successful during his lifetime. Coleridge Taylor also visited the States and inspired American black 
blacks to become composers. The American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, also known as ASCAP, formed in 1914. Dvorak's former pupil, Harry Thacker Burley, was a charter member. In 1919, the National Association of Negro Musicians held its first convention in Chicago, Illinois. In 1921, tenor Roland Hayes gave a performance before King George V of England. In 1923, Hayes debuted at Carnegie Hall. He became one of the world's greatest leader interpreters. In 1926, Undine Smith Moore graduated cum laude from Juilliard. She was the first graduate of Fisk University, a historically black university, to receive a scholarship to Juilliard. 1927 saw Lillian Avanti debut in the title role of Delibes' opera Lachme in France. In 1930, Katerina Darboro debuted in the title role of Verdi's Aida in the Puccini Theater in Milan. 1931 was the year William Grant Still became the first black American composer to have a symphonic work performed by a major American orchestra. The Rochester Philharmonic performed his Afro-American Symphony. Stills had another big first in 1949 when his opera Troubled Island, based on a libretto by Langston Hughes, was performed by the New York City Opera, becoming the first opera by a black person to be performed by a major company. William Grant Still was also the first black man to conduct a major orchestra, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and he won two Guggenheim fellowships. In 1933, Hall Johnson's Run Little Chillin was the first black folk opera produced on Broadway. That same year, Katerina Darborough became the first black woman to appear in a leading role with a major American opera when she again played the role of Aida with the Chicago Opera. Also in 1933, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra performed Florence Price's Symphony in E Minor. She was the first female African-American composer to have a symphonic composition performed by a major American symphony orchestra. In 1934, Four Saints in Three Acts with with music by Virgil Thompson and libretto by Gertrude Stein was the first all-African-American cast opera performed on Broadway. In 1935, George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess opened on Broadway with baritone Todd Duncan as Porgy and sopranos Anne Brown as Bess and Ruby Elsie as Serena. The Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow contralto Marian Anderson to use Constitution Hall. So, in 1939, she gave her concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial instead, drawing a crowd of 75,000. Not to mention the millions who listened on the radio. In 1945, Todd Duncan became the first African-American to sing with a major American opera company when he played the role of Tonio in Leon Cavallo's E. Pagliacci with the New York City Opera. Soprano Camilla Williams signed a contract with the New York City Opera in 1946, becoming the first African-American to do so with a major American opera company. She debuted with the title role of Madame Butterfly. The 1940s were big for African-Americans in opera. In 1947, soprano Helen Phillips was the first African-American to sing on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera. In 1951, William Warfield and Muriel Ron were the first black concert artists on TV. They appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. Howard Swanson's short symphony won the New York Music Critics Award for Best Symphonic Work in 1952, making him the first black composer to do so. In 1953, soprano and educator Dorothy Maynor was the first black person to sing in a U.S. presidential inauguration when she performed the national anthem for Dwight Eisenhower. She paved the way for Beyonce. What? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Robert McFerrin made his Met debut in 1955, becoming the first African-American male to do so as Amonasro in Verdi's Aida. Oh, and later, his son Bobby McFerrin did some pretty cool stuff, too. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> <laughs> In 1963, pianist Andre Watts became the first black instrumental superstar under the baton of Leonard Bernstein. He's done so many things for classical music that we don't even have time yeah. to list them all. <laughs> Margaret Bonds, who frequently collaborated with Langston Hughes, was one of the first black composers and performers in the U.S. to gain recognition. In 1965, when the Freedom March on Montgomery, Alabama took place, she wrote Montgomery Variations for Orchestra, dedicating it to Martin Luther King Jr. In 1968, Henry Lewis became the first black permanent conductor of a major American orchestra when he was appointed to the New Jersey Symphony. 1972 saw Scott Joplin's Trimonesia finally premiere, 55 years after his death, at the Atlanta to Memorial Arts Center. In 1976, Joplin posthumously received a special Pulitzer Prize for his contributions to American music. In 1983 and 1984, trumpeter Wynton Marsalis became the only artist ever to win Grammy Awards for both jazz and classical records. He won the Pulitzer Prize for music in 1997 for Blood on the Fields, a three-hour oratorio for three singers and a 14-member ensemble. The oratorio follows the story of an African couple sold into slavery in the U.S. In 1987, black conductor Paul 
Paul Friedman became founding music director of the Chicago Sinfonietta. This orchestra's mission is musical excellence through diversity. Dr. Friedman served for 24 years. Violinist Aaron P. Dworkin founded the nonprofit Sphinx organization in 1996 to cultivate the development of young black and Latino musicians in the classical music profession. The Sphinx competition spotlights young black and Latino string players on a national platform. The same year that Sphinx was founded, composer George Walker received a Pulitzer Prize for Lilacs for Voice and Orchestra, a work commissioned by the Boston Symphony as part of its tribute to tenor Roland Hayes. This was the first time a living African American won the prize for music. In 2001, mezzo-soprano Denise Graves sang at the National Prayer Service at the Washington National Cathedral following the September 11th attacks. In 2005, James DePriest, a black man and one of classical music's most accomplished conductors, received the National Medal of Arts. Tim Brooks won a 2007 Grammy Award for Best Historical Release with his Lost Sounds, Blacks and the Birth of the Recording Industry, which includes performances by Harry Burley, Roland Hayes, and Edward Boatner. Other contemporary black performers and composers include Jeffrey Mumford, whose orchestral works have been performed by numerous major orchestras in the U.S. And let's not forget David Baker, Awadajan Pratt, and the Imani Winds. And of course we can't forget the amazing voices of Leontine Price, Kathleen Battle, and Jesse Norman. Whoo! We're done. <laughs> We're done. I'm out of breath. <laughs> okay. And, th and there are, of course, a zillion people that we had to leave out for the sake of time. So as you can see, black people have made an impressive contribution to classical music. Yes, and despite all these amazing contributions, blacks are still one of classical music's most underserved communities. As of 2011, according to the League of American Orchestras, only 1.83% of our nation's orchestras make up was black. Aaron Dworkin has pointed out that African-American composers are often missing in traditional classical music station programming. But people like Dworkin are working to change that, and Classical Classroom will do our part, of course, by featuring more of these composers and performers in future episodes. Celebrate Black History Month with us by learning more about blacks and African-Americans in classical music with our handy list of resources over on the Classical Classroom webpage at classical917.org backslash classroom. I'll also post our timeline there. Thanks for your help, Princeton. Thank you, Daisha. Thanks to our producer, Todd Holslander, and for additions to our timeline, Sinjin Flynn and Daniel Webbin. Daniel is also our music research minion. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>